Hello, everyone, and welcome to Off Ice. I'm your host, Ted Barton, along with Mark Hanratty. Mark is coming to us from Nottingham in the United Kingdom. I'm here in Vancouver. Episode number two, Mark, we are going to talk about a coach's life because I think a lot of people don't know how difficult that job is, and we're going to go through a variety of reasons why it's so difficult <laughs> um, and interesting. And you're coaching now. Tell us a little bit about how you got in coaching, um, and then what was your first sort of thoughts about that? Having been a skater, having been a competitor, and starting the coaching, tell us a little bit about your experience. Well, for me, I started coaching as soon as I was age appropriate and age eligible to do it, because I simply needed to fund my own training. And I think that's the case for for so many of the athletes that they can they try to get their their coaching qualifications as soon as possible because it's the best way to earn to pay off the increased debts of their you know their own lessons. Um, so that was my early initiation. And I just remember, it's funny when you ask me about it now, because when I think back to my earliest days of coaching and the just the utter joy and elation at uh, being able to share what I love with other people. And comically, I remember now in that first ice rink in Scotland where I did teach, being excited to teach, um, I think it was called snow tots, <laughs> but like real little tinies. And I was just so enthusiastic and so full of joy and vigor. And it's good that you reminded me of that because I don't think if you asked me to do a snow tots class today, I would have quite the same excitement over it. So um, thank you for the reminder. Well, well, funny enough, let's talk about that snow tots. What an interesting name. But you have so much energy. You probably scared those young kids. <laughs> I think so you probably did. To be doing it. You kept going, whoa, this is a little over the top here, right? Like, <laughs> mommy, save me from the scary man. But I don't, you know what, as a coach, and I coach for 25, 30 years, um, I always love working with teenagers. Uh, the mm -hmm. little ones, they, they hang around you too much. So you never get in the breather because they're, they they go about 10 feet away and do something. They come right back and they look at you and you're going, oh, okay, what do I say now? Like, how do I, how do I reason with this, right? Complicated. But there are those coaches that are experts at young children my my wife is one like that she's absolutely mm. brilliant with kids just brilliant and i'm not uh <laughs> kids love kids but to talk to them I, to teach them I, I find that hard so the teenagers are left because it's a challenge their brains are forming and i know they're all over the map but i kind of like that uh do you have a age preference for teaching well it's interesting you reference it because it and, and what you've articulated there but but your wife diana and about the the needs of different types of coach and so often it is the case that they're different humans because you know obviously not all relationships fit and some humans are just better designed for different types of athlete it's not always the case that you get like a Linda Lever who teaches Brian Boitano from start to finish or a Corey Aid who takes Jason Brown from you know the beginning to Olympic Games level um for me I think the kind of student that I love that every coach loves is the one that is just hungry for the information and it's just so joyous I can think of one at the moment that I'm working with and she's just she kind of hangs on every word and she's just so desperate to absorb the information and that is when it is not a job at all it's just a, a, an utter joy but equally you know you reference teenagers and your your enjoyment of working with teenagers I really enjoy that age group too but then equally there can be that kind of teenager who is resistant who is um feeling hormonal, feeling stressed, feeling full of all sorts of other stuff that, that prevents them from engaging with you as the coach. And that for me can be really challenging, but also really fascinating to see how can I make my energy work with this human to see if I can still get something out of this that is positive for both they and for me. Um, and that is one of the, the really fascinating aspects of our job as coaches is the psychology of humans. Question, how many great, and I don't mean good, I do not mean good, I mean great, how many great teachers did you have in your life, not in skating, in anything that you were being taught? How many great teachers? Mm, no, that, I, oh. I remember I had a French teacher that made me love French, and I don't quite know how or where or why, but she was just really methodical, and I remember that that lady was very good at her job. At that time, when I was in high school, it wasn't I wasn't aware of what made her good. Maybe now as a coach for so many years myself, I might be more mindful of how she engaged me so much. She was great. And then, to be fair, the, 
the free skating course that I had when I switched my first coach. Um, I think it was maybe like 13, 14, 15. And she taught me through all of my free skating years. And she just could not be more passionate about her students. And I, I couldn't replicate the life commitment that she gave to us now myself and I have nothing but respect and admiration and you know it's, it, it's rare that somebody can give themselves so selflessly um, for other people and, and, and that was all respect to Diane for that. So with all the teachers you've had on your life you came up with two right? and my mm. was, I, I always ask everybody this is some people come up with one few people come up with two I've never heard three before um, they're rare great teachers are rare Good teachers are, there's more of them, no question. Yeah. But the great ones, they're unique. They're unique people. They bring something special. It's not about the physicality of what you're being taught. It's about the inspiration in which they fuel you with to try. And they talk you into doing things that you didn't even know you could do because you wanted to please them, because you mm. wanted to, because you want, you wanted to feel that joy because they inspired you. And I, there's not an equation that sort of makes that up, but they're just special. So I, I did want to mention that because special teachers, not in skating only, but in, in anything in life, they're really rare. And when you've got them and you know you've got it, then, well, appreciate it and try to show you. That's, that's, I'm, I'm going to start asking people that question. That's, a, that's very interesting to learn from you wisdom there that not often would a great teacher be brought to mind for more than one or yeah. two people. That's, and cool. you got to make sure that you say, I don't mean good teacher. I mean, great teacher, because there's a significant difference. They might come ah, I had 10 of them. Uh, no one had 10 great teachers, I don't think. Anyways, personal opinion. <laughs> okay, look, let's talk about the difficulties of coaches of a coach's life. I mean, this is really difficult. I think that whether it's a parent of skaters or whether it's an association of people who have never coached before or made a living doing coaching, we're going to talk about the business of coaching. It is not easy. Your salary can get sick. Your salary can change coaches. Your salary can, uh, you know, move locations. Whatever happens, it's always very risky. So, just from a business perspective, forget about the passion and the teaching of the, of the elements. It is a um, you sort of never know type of thing. Is that what you've explained? absolutely? And and the business aspect of coaching because for so many figure skating coaches, I assume if they're like myself and and I gather it's the case for many is skating is your hobby it's your passion it's your joy and then as you age it becomes your way of earning a living and then it becomes um you know the way in which you pay for life and that makes it a little bit messy and confusing and what i think is that there doesn't seem certainly in this country nor in many countries to be an education for skating coaches for the life skills and how to take this joy and passionate love that you have and maintain a bit of that, but still provide for yourself for your future. And I think um, you know, so few coaches really have that education, and I see many struggling with that. I, I completely agree with you. I mean, any uh, young coaches out there that may be listening to this, um, the great thing about this job is you want to go to work every day and that you love working. You have different skaters all the time and there's different challenges and there's great success, a great feeling of a successful jump or a new jump with the skater. There's so many mm -hmm. wonderful things about coaching skating. The challenge is from a long-term perspective is if this is going to be your li living, do you have enough advice or are you smart enough to put your money aside to be able to have the luxury of having a passion as uh, your job for life. And those are things that are not taught as you're right. It's the same thing in our country, although it is mentioned more in our courses now, um, you know, things like uh, your RSPs, things like, uh, you know, keeping your costs down and, you know, what your write-offs are, all those types of things about the business of a coach's life is important because it sounds like a, a big hourly rate, which, which it is for like a part-time job type of thing, but over a whole lifespan, it gets complicated and it's risky and you have to be really smart in doing it. So that's one of the challenges of, um, of coaching um, for, for a living. No question. Let's move into, we'll get back to sort of your recreational skating and you're starting to learning, learning to skate, but let's go into high performance coaches right now. What are some of the challenges that you see as we watch these competitions, the junior grand prix and the senior grand prix, we know a lot of the coaches, some of them are our friends or we've spoken to many of them as well. Um, you know, what do you feel the, the 
great difficulty is in high performance coaching? I think high performance coaching is quite intoxicating and exciting and, and in our in our little world it's quite glamorous when you see a coach at the world championships or you, know, you, you regularly see some of the same faces so there's a, a, an element of ego and excitement and that is something that so many coaches aspire to have but then for, for me the, the challenge is then it's a bit like pro- professional performing skaters so often you know, I know skaters that continue performing, continue performing, continue performing, and then they put their life on hold and they maybe forgo the opportunity to have a family and settle down. And I think that so often can be the case for uh, elite level coaches. And, and maybe if they've been an elite skater themselves and they're so used to endless hours committed to their craft and they then pass that kind of borderline obsession on to, to raising the next generation of elite skater. And then I know some that then find themselves in, in their middle ages and think, well, where's my life and and how do I keep this up and maintain this? And that's that's something that, um again, another one of those things that isn't talked about, isn't spoken about. And and it's, like I say, I think it's a drug. Competition can be a bit of a drug. You, you go back for more, you go back for that thrill-seeking excitement of seeing success. Um, but as with all drugs, there can be some <laughs> downsides. So, so are you saying that that you know high performance coaching that the exciting part of it is uh, the competition? And uh, because my question to you before I heard that was going to be, well, what is more difficult for a coach? The training over months of arduous training, hours every day, working with that athlete as they're growing up and going through all sorts of different things, um, or the subtlety, well, not so subtle in some cases, the challenge of coaching. At a high at a high level competition, you know you're at the world championships. You've got your athlete. Yes, they're well prepared. What do you say? What do you not say? You know how uh, how do you read them? Which one is more difficult, the training or the competition? I, and that's for the coach. For, I mean, I think for the coach is undoubtedly the the training because that's that's their opportunity to showcase that they have the ability to create an elite level athlete. At event, I think. Hmm, the events are the extremely, extremely emotional aspect, I think, for all to, to maintain calm and equilibrium. And to some extent, an event should just be a continuation of training. And if a coach has got a good psychological education and, and, and dealing with the, the, the highly strong emotions of event, they should be able to, to help the student through that. Um, I think hmm, some people, again, can be built for some humans are built for supporting somebody through the stress of competition and some are built for training them daily the day-to-day grind and again it just takes like you said about great teachers takes a really great human that can educate day-to-day to to elite levels of, of olympic level quality and then also help to create calm equilibrium to deliver that under the pressure of an event so different strokes for different folks and um For me, I feel like I was such a struggling competitor myself that when it comes to competition, I'd like to say, you can ask the students I work with, that I am good at an event situation. Yeah, yeah, interesting. But but it takes, but I haven't given, and I don't know if I ever would because I don't know if I can, I haven't given the life commitment to creating an elite level athlete, because to me, that's a decade, two decades of my life. Yeah. But I don't know if I can do as a father and as a as a husband. And so, yeah, that's that's a big, that's a big, big investment. Investment. That's a big life investment. You know, there's no, no question about that. Now, let's talk a little bit about because you've got the athlete, but you also have the humanity, the, the person, that young developing person. This is very difficult. And I think, you know, there's been lots of discussion and and some you know bad moments uh in coaching not just figure skating in in, in many of the uh, sports around the world um because you are asked to by the athlete and by the parents and by the federation and by the public and by everyone to turn out a successful <coughs> athlete at the same time you have a young person that's growing up complicated in life simply by itself without any additional stresses of life but you choose to do that so that balance between the type of discipline or 
or encouragement that you need to push that athlete to experience the difficult, the quad jump or running your program twice in a row, or, you know, the bad days, the good days, all those types of things. It's very, very complicated for a coach. And I think high performance coaches have to be um, obviously very aware of just that little person and growing up emotionally and physically, psychologically along the way and how they nurture that at the same time, how they, help show that athlete what they're capable of both physically and psychologically. It's a very, very fine balance. Your thoughts. Well, this is a fantastic and, and fascinating topic. I think the challenge is greatest for the type of coach. You can either obviously coach by the, you know, the carrot or the stick, the, you know, motivated praise and, and, and encourage or the stick that, you know, the borderline abusive and, 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 it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that there are those type of coaches in the world, not just in our sport, but in all sports. My um, research in sports leads me to believe that the stick method, um, their aggressive approach, can quite often churn out a successful athlete, um, but is not good for the human and the holistic aspect. The coach that I, don't know if respect is the right word, but the coach that I think has the greatest challenge is one that doesn't have an environment of other elite athletes. They don't work in, a, in an environment or a skating nation, if we're talking about skating, where there are an abundance of other elite athletes. And they have, and, but they want to encourage, they want to be positive, they want to have a holistic approach to the human. I think their challenge is perhaps greater because they are not in an environment whereby the skater doesn't have to just take their word because they see it around them. And so as a, as a process of osmosis, the environment fuels the skater to great success encouraged also by the coach and those types of, of coaches I just think are, are, are incredible humans when you get somebody maybe like um, oh gosh I'm trying to think of and I don't know the history of the athletes but when you get a small skating nation skater that has created success from a positive environment I don't know if Javier Fernandez had that I don't know how much he trained with Brian Orser before but a small skating nation who makes the, the breakout um, yeah. because there's no doubt that you know that the hubs of centres of excellence makes sense because it's not just then entirely about the coach but about the environment which fuels the skater um and that's just not always possible financially for all skaters to tap into the unique individualism of not just the skater but the coach as well let's talk a little bit about mm. matches if you will like what type of skater or what type of coach matches a certain skater well because skaters sometimes want a certain type of approach from the coach but they may not have articulated that have you ever had a student that you're going you know what and I, I, me speaking as you, you would say to the athlete, as much as I love teaching you, I don't think that I'm the right coach for you. I don't think that I can help you because you feel that there's not that connection there. Have you ever had that experience? Well, I would be certainly up until this stage of my coaching career, I think I would never have admitted that. I, would never, you know, I just have to, to adapt myself to the needs of this this athlete, they obviously need something different for me, so I need to have a real think and sit down and see how can I consider my approach differently to help this this skater flourish and um, to whatever their potential lies. Uh, and more recently, um, I was working with a dance team and they had very different upbringings from their parents and from their cultures, from different skating, different nations. And the, the male half of the team wanted an aggressive approach and, and articulated, not necessarily eloquently, but articulated that um, I was too nicey-nicey. And at the time, I remember thinking, oh, first of all, oh, okay, oh, okay, you, you're, you're probably right, right, I'll try and then give you what you need. And maybe, I, and, and perhaps older or, or a version of me in the past would have then stepped up and, and given what they needed but now for me, I, I've come to realize that I know um, the human that I am and I'm at peace with that human. And if my approach isn't right for them, then it's just not, um, it's, it's just not the best optimal working partnership. And so um, I think that's it's a good place to be at when you can recognize um, your strengths and your weaknesses. That's for sure. No question. Complicated. It is really complicated, high-performance coaching. And 
I did that for many years and really loved it. It was ex always exciting and was always asking or questioning myself, geez, did I do the right thing here? Or should I have done this? Should I have done that? And it is complicated. We're going to talk a little bit more about this during the Junior Grand Prix. Hopefully we'll speak to some of the coaches about their profession mm -hmm. and about the challenges they have and learn more about it. I think the figure skating coaches do not get enough credit for the extraordinary work that they do with the person and the athlete and the artist. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Of course, recreational skating coaches, that's kind of the fun part. You're still doing what you love. The success of young athletes, the pressure to have great successes isn't there. You're usually always at work because you're not traveling around the world. So I think a lot of people who love to coach skating love not to do the high performance because they can enjoy it. And it's more of a steady job, if you will, for them and, and more enjoyable as well. So, um, you know, I, I, I can totally understand that people say, sign me up for Learn to Skate. Or sign me up for in our can in, in our country we have a star skate program which has competition but it's not representing Canada it has a fun more fun approach to competition itself. Um, so let me just ask you let's say a little bit more about coaching here. How would you define yourself as a coach? If you were to describe yourself, with, okay, don't give me four paragraphs, just a sentence or two. How would you define yourself as a coach? <laughs> You said don't give me four paragraphs. I was like, come on, Ted. I only talk in like <laughs> essays. Um, I think I would say positive, probably uh, positive. Uh, I think increasingly caring, but multifaceted. Okay. Because I can be, I can be, I can be her uh, if I need to be. If the occasion arises, I can give like, oh, come on. Yeah, well, you know, it's amazing. There is such an element of responsibility that you have shaping the human and that comes along with pressure and with privilege, or maybe I should say privilege and pressure. No question there. But it's not a debate. It's a discussion to have with many people so that more people understand the complications of coaching skating, at least in the competitive sense. We'll, we'll talk to a number of the uh, coaches, uh, Mark, I hope we do, uh, interview some of the coaches during the uh, Junior Grand Prix. Up next on the Junior Grand Prix, we'll be moving on to Linz, Austria. I'll be there live. Mark will be back at home in the studio in Nottingham. And the third installment into Off Ice, we'll take a look at uh, group changes through time. Make sure you join us for that.